Um, I think we're expecting um, our ranking member in just a few moments. She got a bit caught up. Oh, there she is. Fantastic. Um, wonderful. Okay. So welcome everyone. Um, first, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present at the hearing. Just a few reminders. Um, and so, uh, and I'm going to just go over the, the precepts of the hearing as we get started. So this hearing will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to House Resolution 8 today, the committee is meeting virtually. So I do want to announce a couple reminders to the members about the conduct of this remote hearing. Um, as I mentioned, keep your video feed on as long as you are present. Members are responsible for their own microphones, always dangerous. Um, please keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. Good morning. Welcome to the first Environment Subcommittee hearing of the 117th Congress. I would also like to welcome Ranking Member Bice to the subcommittee. Ranking Member of the full committee, Congressman Lucas, is also here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to continuing the subcommittee's bipartisan work to advance our understanding of the Earth system and support science that empowers us to confront the pressing challenges that we face with the climate crisis. Climate change is increasingly an acute, costly reality for businesses and communities across the country, whether it's electric utilities facing increased threats from drought and wildfires, or city streets inundated with stormwater runoff and sunny day flooding. As Congress considers investments to rebuild our country's infrastructure and take action to mitigate the most catastrophic impacts of the climate crisis, the best available science is crucial to making sure that precious dollars are spent on projects that will last. Today's hearing is about making sure our nation's state-of-the-art climate observations, modeling, and research makes it into the hands of the workers upgrading our highways and bridges, growing our food, and retrofitting our buildings. The gaps in actionable climate risk information are impacting communities like the ones I represent in the 11th District of New Jersey. My constituents have long experienced flooding, but climate change is only increasing the risk for more frequent and intense heavy precipitation events in our area. For example, in 2018, nearly five inches of precipitation fell in just 50 minutes, causing catastrophic flooding in Caldwell, Little Falls, and Woodland Park, even carrying away 42 cars from a Jeep dealership. And when Hurricane Irene hit, rains flooded parts of Morristown, washing away the bottom floor of the historic Bethel AME Church. To help us understand how this reality will affect us in the near term, federal scientific agencies collect large-scale trusted data from NOAA satellites and USGS stream gauges, stream gauges. While these data inform some of the best climate models and research in the world, they don't always get translated into tools and local information that can help a family in Pequannock decide whether to purchase a mortgage in a flood prone area or help a town manager in Pompton Lakes determine when to dredge rivers to minimize flood hazards or assist officials in Fairfield assess the need to raise homes to avoid flooding damage. This is both a science issue and an equity issue. The private sector is building innovative products underpinned by federal data to help their clients and understand and act on climate risk. However, at a time when state and local governments are resource strapped, not all communities can hire consultants or a climate services firm to help them incorporate climate risk into their resilience planning. Smaller and rural communities, as well as underserved communities and communities of color, which are often first hit and worst hit by climate change, must have the basic information they need to make the difficult adaptation decisions we are facing now and in the years to come. While the private sector is a critical partner, it cannot replace an authoritative, accessible baseline of federal science and climate services. Federal climate services should also incorporate sustained feedback and co-production of knowledge with impacted communities to make sure the science remains decision relevant as user needs rapidly change. Earlier this year, I introduced two bills to tackle the challenge of flooding and improve climate risk information. The Precip Act, would update nationwide authoritative precipitation studies and incorporate future climate risk into the studies in order to improve local flood mapping, weather prediction, and resilience planning. The Floods Act would establish a national integrated flood information system at NOAA 
to coordinate and integrate flood research across the agency and make improvements to flood forecasts, watches, and warnings. These bills are just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to improving authoritative and actionable federal tools and technical assistance for climate adaptation. Similarly, I hope that this conversation is the beginning of a robust dialogue on the subcommittee about what a, federal, what a system of federal climate services should look like and how it can best serve communities on the front lines of this crisis. I'm pleased to welcome our distinguished panel of witnesses today who will help provide critical perspectives on this issue. And now I'd like to uh, recognize Ranking Member Bice for her opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. I'm looking forward to this first subcommittee hearing as well as a productive relationship throughout this entire Congress. There are few states who would benefit more from a better understanding of weather and climate than Oklahoma. We're home to 86,000 farms that feed and clothe our state, our nation, and the world. Entire families' livelihood depend on long-term and short-term weather patterns. So any future changes resulting from a change in climate need to be effectively communicated to them. Arguably the most important component of any farmer's operation and a topic of conversation today is precipitation. It's common sense that too little rain results in a drought and farmers will have lower yields as a result. But people often overlook that too much rain, either in frequency or volume, also presents problems to crop production. Precisely predicting both high and low values informs what crops to plant and when to harvest. Therefore, accurate and trustworthy data, along with a variety of other information, is essential to an entire industry and many states' main economic driver. And due to the unique geography of individual states, a mix of federal and local services is ideal. It is not a one-size-fits-all puzzle. Currently, the federal government, through the National Weather Service and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, operates Atlas 14, which provides precipitation frequency estimates that become the standard for relevant regulation, permits, and recommended best practices. States use this information for standards in designing, building, and operating infrastructure to withstand the forces of heavy precipitation and floods. At the same time, many states have recognized the need for additional data and have dedicated their own resources to protect lives and properties with accurate forecasts and predictions. There is no better example than Oklahoma, where two of the state's premier universities, Oklahoma State and the University of Oklahoma, have long histories of researching weather patterns. The National Weather Service the nation's leading facility in researching climate and weather is based in Norman, Oklahoma. Additionally, you'll find no more valued state resource than the Oklahoma Mesonet. Founded as a partnership between Oklahoma State and the University of Oklahoma, the Mesonet takes weather observations every five minutes, then transmits this data to a central process facility, which in turn puts it out to the public five to 10 minutes later. With with one Mesonet station in every Oklahoma county collecting data 24 hours per day year round, weather events like thunderstorms, wind gusts, heat bursts, and dry lines can't go undetected and wreak havoc on an unsuspecting farm or ranch. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Jeff Becerra, a professor and researcher at the University of Oklahoma. His research is focused on land atmosphere interactions and understanding the complex relationship between weather, climate, water, and ecosystems. He'll be able to share with us how he has utilized federal climate information in his research and how state-based systems like the Mesonet are factoring in climate risks and being used by on-the-ground decision makers. Especially, Dr. Becerra can speak to how the agriculture industry has been at the forefront of adapting to climate and weather risks. Oklahoma is just one example of a state taking the lead. But as my colleagues from Iowa and Florida will tell you, not everyone is facing the same risks. Soil precipitation data from Oklahoma doesn't do much for good, uh, doesn't do much good for rising water levels in the Florida Everglades. 
That's why I'm hopeful today's discussion will focus on what information and data localities need, not just increasing bureaucracy with another government agency or service. Through federal-led partnerships with academics, states, private industry, we can identify what information is most needed and then work to provide it in a cost-effective, resourceful way. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl, for hosting this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Bice. Uh, we're also excited to have the full committee ranking member, Mr. Lucas, with us today. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl, and of course, uh, Chairwoman Johnson, for bringing together this excellent panel and hearing. I look forward to seeing the productive work of this subcommittee as we move further into the 117th Congress. I also want to take a moment and recognize the new ranking member of the Environment Subcommittee, Representative Stephanie Bice. Like me, she's an Oklahoman who's seen extreme weather events up close and personal. Therefore, she recognizes the critical role of advanced weather prediction and forecasting, something this committee has long prioritized. I have no doubt she'll be a great voice for Oklahoma and the entire U.S. weather enterprise. And speaking of the U.S. weather enterprise, this hearing is particularly focused on two bills that have the potential to update the data and information we collect regarding weather events. The Precept and Flood Acts amend the Weather Research and Forecasting Innovation Act of 2017, legislation that I introduced that was later signed into law. While I welcome next steps to build off the life-saving policies of the Weather Act, I caution against inflating this to establishing a federalized climate service. An important pillar of the Weather Act was directing NOAA to partner with private sector for weather data collection used in its forecasts. It's become the Weather Act that NOAA currently has, because of the Weather Act, NOAA currently has a clear vision and flexibility when it comes to acquiring weather and climate data. Isolating these efforts to a new duplicative service only serves to create more red tape and hurdles to our budding weather industry. It's also important to note that NOAA is currently a climate service providing information and research to prepare for and adapt to climate variability and change. This is primarily done through the Regional Integrated Science and Assessments Program and the Regional Climate Centers, both of which are focused on community level information and risk. So before we rush to create a new office, I wanna hear from our expert panel on what is currently being provided by the federal government when it comes to climate risk and weather, and if there are deficiencies or gaps we're here to help make sure that communities' needs are being met, hopefully through existing channels. We have an obligation to provide our citizens the most accurate information on climate and weather events so they can make informed decisions for their own well-being. I believe that is the best, way, best done by maximizing our resources through partnerships with the private sector and academic institutions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Thank you. And if there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I would like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Richard Moss. Dr. Moss is a senior scientist at the Joint Global Change Research Institute and a non-resident fellow of the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University. He has published research on climate scenarios, adaptation, and decision-making support. Dr. Moss currently chairs the convening board for the Science for Climate Action Network, which is committed to improving the use of science to more effectively respond to climate change. Our next witness is Beth Gibbons. Ms. Gibbons is the executive director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. In this role, she has strengthened the capacity of adaptation individuals and organizations accelerated development of the adaptation field and played a, a key role in mapping the movement of climate data from its production to its use. Ms. Gibbons has additional experience with climate science from previously serving as program manager of the NOAA Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center of the Great Lakes Region and as director of the University of Michigan's Climate Center. Our third witness is Dr. Jeffrey Becerra, Dr. Becerra is the Executive Associate Director of the Hydrology and Water Security Program at the University of Oklahoma and an Associate Professor of the University of Oklahoma School of Meteorology and School of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science. 
His research focuses on precipitation extremes, land atmosphere interactions, and the development of observational and modeling strategies. Our final witness is Liz Williams Russell. Ms. Russell is the Climate Justice Program Director at Foundation for Louisiana, where she has leveraged $54 million toward climate justice planning, managed a public adaptation planning process, supported water workforce training and certification programs, and advanced research on the coastal climate trends affecting Louisiana. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel and we will start with Dr. Moss. Good morning and thank you, Subcommittee Chairwoman Cheryl, Subcommittee Ranking Member Bice, Full Committee Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. I note my comments represent my views and not those of the Department of Energy. Over my career, I've looked at climate, inf climate information issue from many angles, both in science and applications. I've also helped coordinate federal research as the director of the Office of the U.S. Global Chain Re Change Research Program under Presidents Clinton and Bush. I've contributed to local, national, and international assessments and been a staff member at several NGOs working on climate action. I've seen promising, several promising federal approaches to climate services fail after confronting a wide range of foreseen and unforeseen challenges. Today, I want to highlight some ideas and principles that could contribute to success. There is a clear opportunity for federal leadership. Currently, climate services are provided by many different entities, including both federal agencies and non-federal agencies, such as regional networks, university centers, NGOs, and private sector firms. This structure has many advantages. The diversity of providers reflects the diversity of local, regional, sectoral, and institutional contexts where climate action needs to be taken. Non-federal providers have developed trusted relationships with users, which will be critical to ensure information is trusted and put into practice. They are well-placed to integrate climate science with detailed local knowledge. Greater federal action is needed to take more of a leadership role and create a new framework that improves our existing distributed system and adds five things. Strong governance framework with clear lines of communication and authority, findable, accessible, and usable data and information, support for many types of technical assistance and engagement, ongoing research and processes for learning from experience, and finally, sufficient resources to support strong governance and provide incentives to participate. My written testimony addresses each of these, but for reasons of time, today I will focus on just three. First, requirements for governments. A critical first step to improve climate services is to engage non-federal players in developing a strategy. Non-federal and federal actors must work together to articulate a vision, mission, and goals, as well as principles for setting priorities, participation, and quality assurance. Effective governance will require new authority or a coordination mechanism, as well as strong non-political standing oversight. Several reports, including a 2016 Government Accountability Office study, highlight options. Whatever option is used, the new entity will need to have sufficient authority to set priorities and negotiate adjustments to agency efforts. Furthermore, this effort should have a mechanism for maintaining stability across administrations. Finally, direct engagement with existing climate services networks and providers and with local uh, to regional users must be sustained. Second, technical assistance. Research has shown that communities of color and economically disadvantaged communities face even greater burdens from climate change related impacts for a number of reasons. For example, because they disproportionately live in more vulnerable areas. If our system for climate services is to contribute to realizing our, our ideals as a nation, it will need to include deep engagement with these communities, as well as substantial funding for technical assistance and other measures to ensure all have access to needed information and support, irrespective of their ability to pay. 
Finally, with respect to the need for research and assessment, while our understanding of climate change and its impacts on society has advanced rapidly, support for research at agencies like the Department of Energy, NOAA, and NASA, and other agencies that participate in the USGCRP must increase if we are to continue improving knowledge that is relevant at the local level where most solutions will be implemented. More support is also needed for solutions-oriented research. My written statement and an underlying report describe one aspect, how to evaluate practical experience through a well-organized method for learning by doing. This method could be incorporated into a national climate information system, the national climate assessment, and or pending legislation on flooding and extreme events that we've heard about that's before this committee. In conclusion, I applaud the committee for recognizing the country's urgent need to better coordinate and accelerate the delivery of climate services to address growing climate impacts. I hope that my testimony has provided some helpful insights as you work to address this challenge. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Next, we have Ms. Gibbons. Good morning, Subcommittee Chairwoman Cheryl, Subcommittee Ranking Member Bice, Ranking Member, Ranking Committee Member Lucas, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the state of climate change adaptation, the role of federal agencies, and the opportunities and obligations we have before us to use our collective action to create more resilient communities. My name is Beth Gibbons, and I serve as the Executive Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. I live in Southeast Michigan on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe people, the three fires people who are Ottawa, Ojibwa, and Potawatomi, and Wyandotte, in a place that today is called Ypsilanti, Michigan. I've spent the last 20 years working on community development and a decade focused specifically on climate change adaptation in the United States. In my career, it's been a privilege to serve as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer, the program manager for the NOAA RESA program of the Great Lakes region, and the director of University of Michigan's Climate Center. When I left working in the public sector, I did so because I saw an acute need for coordination and support to the growing ranks of climate adaptation professionals across North America. As recently as 10 years ago, there was no U.S. organization focusing on accelerating and standardizing the climate change adaptation field in practice, but thankfully that's no longer the case. ASAP connects and supports climate change adaptation and resilience professionals to advance innovative and just adaptation across North America. Successful adaptation is holistic and requires coordination from the federal to the local level and across multiple sectors and disciplines. Gone is the time when we can attempt to deliver single issue solutions to our complex communities challenges. And the adaptation field is full of leaders and change makers with diverse backgrounds and types of expertise. The thread that connects all of us is the adaptation, is the ASAP's definition of adaptation professionals, those who integrate future climate information into their day to day work. ASAP members have integrated updated rain data into rural and urban runoff models to better understand the impact of climate change on sensitive ecosystems like Saginaw Bay. Our members built a regional climate collaborative in Southeast Florida to share climate information and reach consensus on planning and design standards for an economically and ecologically interconnected region. Adaptation professionals worked with public health officials in Illinois and states across the Midwest to integrate relevant climate information into known public health concerns, developing climate health impact reports to help states and communities prevent the worst impacts from climate change being recognized. And finally, ASAP members are working today with corporations and in pushing international institutions to consider how community resilience and equity can be part of public disclosure recommendations and couple corporate and community resilience solutions. In order for climate adaptation and resilience to be successful, we need the federal government to play a critical role in the development and dissemination of locally relevant climate data and information. However, it does not stop there. Climate change adaptation is a rapidly growing and innovative professional practice. To grow this profession and industry, we need to better understand the needs of the existing workforce and provide education and technical support to train people to do this important work. The climate adaptation profession is standardizing its values and practices and new adaptation programs, including a federal climate service, should align with these field spanning standards. 
There are strong networks in place across tribes at national, regional, and metropolitan levels, which are vehicles for disseminating best practice, providing peer support, and building regional governance strategies to support adaptation and mitigation policy and practice. These same networks must inform the design of a new climate service and be vehicles for delivering information, service, grants, and other program elements. A robust climate adaptation and resilience marketplace is emerging, and there are important roles for the federal agencies and programs to play to ensure service providers and service seekers from all economic and racial backgrounds have access to the same high quality, actionable climate data and information. So I'm heartened by the renewed energy and enthusiasm of this committee and the whole Biden-Harris administration to address the impact of climate change on people across the United States. And while I'm heartened with this new enthusiasm, I'll close today with a request that that enthusiasm for action be met with earnest intention and effort to learn what's needed to accelerate action from the adaptation professionals working on this topic every day and from the communities actively employing adaptation and resilience strategies to combat the dire impacts of climate change. At ASAP, it's all about the people, the people in the communities that we serve and the professionals of today and tomorrow who are seeking to make our country more resilient. Thank you. Wow, you ended right on the dot. <laughs> that does my military heart good. Okay, uh, next we have Dr. Becerra. Good morning, Subcommittee Chair Cheryl, Subcommittee Ranking Member Bice, Committee Ranking Member Lucas, and members of the committee. Thank you for the honor and privilege of testifying today. I'm also grateful to both the majority and minority staff, along with Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer, for their insight and assistance in preparing for the subcommittee hearing. While I am not speaking directly on behalf of the University of Oklahoma, I am testifying today in my roles as an academic, as a researcher, as an administrator, a teacher, and advisor of matters of science related to weather, climate, water, and ecosystems. And this topic of climate services is critically important and relevant across the spectrum of, of socioeconomic sectors that form the foundation of the United States. Weather and climate is one of the truly few processes that impact every human. In my career, I have seen firsthand how the collection and dissemination of weather and climate information has a tangible impact on the citizens we serve spanning all communities, urban, rural, and everyone in between. As an example, uh, because of my research and associated efforts in the Great Plains of the United States, I have been able to directly engage agricultural producers through a variety of on-site and virtual workshops and events. Typically, I focus on education related to the topics of drought and excessive precipitation, and I share the latest science that helps us to understand the development and evolution of these topics, especially as related to the, to the area, the Great Plains, and specifically to agriculture. Inevitably, my first question from the audience, um, regardless of time of year or location, is always along a consistent theme. What will the conditions be two, four, six months from now? In other words, they want to know what the weather and climate conditions can be expected in the foreseeable future because that impacts local productivity over and along with overall market demand. And answering that question is a critical challenge given the many weather and climate processes that play a role in impacting local, regional, and national communities within that window of time. We've all seen the impacts of severe weather, landfalling hurricanes, excessive rainfall, flooding, drought, heat waves, and even more recently, extended cold snaps. The cost of extreme events have been steadily increasing in terms of billion dollar events in the United States. In 2020 alone, we saw as a country, 22 events with a price tag from these events alone of nearly $100 billion. These large events capture the bulk of the attention, but local communities and their end users are often impacted in subtle ways that are also significant. I was reading today in the Chicago Tribune and Jeff Kerwan, who is on the board of directors for the Illinois Farm Bureau, is quoted as saying that we do, we do see more severe, we, we do seem to see more severe weather, more dynamic rainfalls, drier spells. He continued that the future, when you look at it, it, look into that crystal ball, is a whole bunch of uncertainty. That's their story. And here in, at the same time in Oklahoma today, agricultural producers are walking their fields, are in the process of determining what the impact of a late season freeze just this morning means to their 2021 livelihoods. The United States is a key global contributor of weather and climate data collection through a variety of observing systems on the ground and space-borne. 
Such observations serve as the backbone for data sets used to determine past, present, and future states of weather and climate processes from local to global scales. And as such, these data sets are associated with applications that are inherently valuable to end users across a wide spectrum of socioeconomic sectors here in the United States and around the world. However, we need federal support to provide this information in a way that strongly considers the perspective of the end users involved. Certainly, it all begins with maintained support and expanded support of our environmental data collection efforts at all levels, especially at the federal level. We also need to identify gaps and resources while strengthening support for the existing web of federal to state to local community connections that serve to disseminate critical climate information to end users. Finally, timing and trust matter. What we provide must be trustworthy. Otherwise, it is of limited to no value to our end users. In, close, in closing, we continue to face significant looming challenges as related to weather and climate in the United States, and I sincerely appreciate the desire of the subcommittee to address this challenge. At the same time, we have local, state, and federal capacity to tackle these challenges, and that's an opportunity to impact the lives and livelihoods of our end users and the stakeholders from our local to our global communities. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And our final witness today is Ms. Russell. Chairwoman Cheryl, ranking members Bikin Lucas, and members of the subcommittee and committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the need for a strengthened federal role in addressing climate change. I encourage thoughtful investment and provision of authority for coordinated risk information and climate services that center the needs of the nation's frontline communities while creating equitable and sustainable pathways to holistically address climate impacts. We must enhance and develop replicable and scalable approaches while building generational capacity for long-term positive change. I'm the Climate Justice Program Director at Foundation for Louisiana. We're a catalyst for justice. FFL invests in communities and ideas, builds partnerships, and transforms policies and systems for an equitable, stronger Louisiana. Louisiana is on the front lines of climate change and is necessarily developing solutions to address the climate crisis, both through adaptation and emissions mitigation measures. Louisiana has lost over 2,000 square miles of land since the 1930s. Since 2005, every one of our 64 parishes has been under at least one, if not four, five, or six federal flood declarations. Residents with resources are moving to areas they perceive as higher and safer grounds, shifting local tax revenue and influencing rippling climate impacts in our communities. Within areas losing population amidst depreciating property values and loss of amenities, we see a decline in ability to maintain social services and lost capacity to invest in existing and new infrastructure to support communities or mitigate risk. In areas gaining population, schools and traffic swell while new development expands without regard for sea level rise and increasing flood risk. These are mere entry points into a dialogue of climate impacts already being faced by our communities. Without strategic and intentional action, climate change and our institutional responses to it will exacerbate inequities. Drawing on my experiences and those of communities I serve in Louisiana, I believe specific items need to be center of focus for federal resources and action. In Louisiana and elsewhere, access to localized information and technical assistance varies dramatically across jurisdictions. This access is dependent on local revenue streams and socioeconomic conditions with a tendency to manifest institutionalized disparities as variations in local capacity to address challenges or create opportunities. Each time a seemingly helpful government official shows up to share projections of a given existential crisis, residents and constituencies without the financial means to address those calamities can often feel increasingly helpless. Created by FFL, Lead the Coast is a comprehensive leadership, education, and advocacy development program designed to equip resident leaders with tools they need for effective civic engagement, increasing the capacity of local people and institutions most impacted by climate change. Replicated nationally and supported at the federal level, a similar program would allow prioritization and investment in the places that have seen systematic underinvestment and ensure any information regarding climate hazards brought to constituents is presented alongside tangible pathways to actually tackle the risks. Grow practices that center the expertise of communities as leaders, designers, and decision makers to cultivate innovative and resp sustained response to this generational challenge. 
When considering the siting of future investments to reduce risk and improve adaptive capacity for communities, many federal agencies utilize cost-benefit analyses that rely heavily on racialized real estate valuation practices that improperly tip the scales regarding who experiences the costs and the benefits. Across federal agencies, replace metrics that exacerbate the existing imbalance of government resource distribution, prioritize marginalized communities, and ensure that federal projects and policies illustrate government follow through. Agencies most familiar with climate change and impacts don't systematically engage with agencies whose assets, programming, and investment decisions might be relevant. Improve direct communication, coordination, and collaboration between data and modeling entities and those who provide services to communities and government. Develop a structure of staffing, funding, and decision-making authority so that cooperation is iterative and ongoing, evolving with experience of impacts on the ground. I'm from New Orleans and my family is spread across South Louisiana. My roots here engender a passion and a commitment to defend and champion the places I love. The evolving climate impacts are real and personal and vast. Residents from across the political spectrum acknowledge ongoing climate change and still few Americans understand the depth and breadth of climate impacts to everything we care about. Climate change is not a future scenario here. I encourage you to advance efforts and investments that treat your constituents with dignity and acknowledge the humanity in all of us. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses. Before we proceed, I'd like to bring the subcommittee's attention to 12 letters for the record. These letters express support for improved investment in and coordination of federal climate services. The letters represent the broad constituencies urging federal action on this issue, including global change research organizations, private sector providers of climate services, the adaptation practitioner community, and local leaders that focus on climate adaptation and mitigation. Without objection, I'm placing these documents in the record. At this point, we will begin our first round of questions. I recognize myself for five minutes. So to begin, federal and non-federal organizations are already providing on the ground technical assistance and tools to help communities understand and act on their climate risk. For example, New Jersey is supported by the Consortium on Risk in the Urban Northeast, which is one of NOAA's 11 regional integrated sciences and assessment centers. We're also lucky to have access to the state-funded New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center at Rutgers, which provides flood maps and visualizations of climate risks to infrastructure and critical assets across New Jersey. Can each of the witnesses discuss the fragmented nature of the available tools and technical assistance to local decision makers? What is the federal government's role in coordinating diverse services across regions and sectors so that key constituencies know where to go to get the information they need? I'd be happy to, oh, sorry, that's not right. Richard, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, well, I can just offer maybe a, a little bit of a description of the landscape um, that helps to um, explain the diversity of sources and why it can be confusing. Um, you know, you have um, a, a range of federal agencies, not just NOAA, that provide a lot of um, climate inf climate related information um, and, and modeling. Um, you have uh, 11 NOAA RESAs, um, eight Department of Interior Climate Adaptation Science Centers, and eight USDA climate hubs. Um, in, additional, in addition, there's a series of uh, international activities like the World Climate Research Program, uh, which is perhaps the most definitive in developing um, the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, which is now in its sixth phase, that serves as a, as a critical source of, of all of the kind of climate scenario information that people analyze. Um, a variety of NGOs also provide uh, climate information uh, through activities uh, like the American Geophysical Union's Thriving Earth Exchange. And then there are ac academic centers and partners, partnerships, um, and finally, private sector firms. Now, the, the 
uh, when I was, I was recently on a leave of absence and working in New York, um, one of the first questions I was asked when I arrived uh, and started working on my project was by state agencies uh, who were in, interested in knowing what criteria could they use to evaluate different proposals for climate services or to decide which data sets that they should use. Um, and I'll just say based on that experience, just as the anecdote in New York, there is a lot of confusion among users about where to turn. Um, and I think that this is in fact, one of the things that we hope a more unified federal effort that doesn't replace or try to set up a, a, a um, single source for all information, but that serves as a point of contact and helps direct people to the appropriate information would be an excellent choice. Uh, it's just that there's no one model that captures all features of the earth system or that in all places can provide the right information. The average hottest and driest model is not the hottest and driest model everywhere. There's a lot of variability. And so you can't just pick one model and hope that it's gonna do the job. I would just respond to your, your question regarding the user perspective. And I think, um, I think that Richard did a fine job articulating the different agencies. And I should say that none of these agencies and their programs are covering the same jurisdictions at the same time in the same way. So the 11 RISAs, the eight CASCs, the way that um, the EPA regions and FEMA regions each treat the country as a patchwork. And it's very confusing for people from the ground up to look at that patchwork and then identify what is the pathway to service. And so users often will end up pursuing a pathway to information based on what they might have already experienced. If they've worked with HUD, they try to go through HUD. If they've had experience with a NOAA through a RISA, they go to the RISA. If they have experience with EPA through consent decrees or other kinds of functions, they go to EPA. And because of that, it's important that we have coordination across federal agencies so that we're all receiving the same information. Um, and I think it also makes the case for a federal system to coordinate service so that it isn't just on an individual at each agency to touch with somebody else, but there is an entity that is ensuring that coordination takes place so that people can experience a kind of a, a no wrong door policy, but then has a strong governance to ensure, in fact, when you come through that door, you're going to reach someone who can connect you to what you need. Well, thank you very much. Are there currently enough federal resources dedicated to working with communities to ensure they have the climate risk information they need? So it sounds like we've talked a little bit about the coordination problem, um, but beyond that, are there enough federal resources uh, available simply not coordinated well? No, no, Could I not, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask for just one clarification. When you say uh, resources, uh, Chairwoman Cheryl, do you mean financial resources? Or are you talking about information resources or technical support or all of it? So I'm talking about all of the above. It sounds like we have quite a few resources dedicated to this. There seems to be a coordination problem. Is there beyond a coordination problem also a resource problem? Yes, I would say so, and I'll, I'll be very brief so others can, can um, also add their points of view, but um, we simply don't have enough resources to do the kind of um, customization that we need to make the data relevant at local levels. In addition, there simply is not enough support to provide um, technical support for communities and understanding you know, how this information relates to the problems that they have or the things that they're trying to solve. Um, you can get, to, you know, data on temperature precipitation, but what does it actually mean for how you might have to change your cropping cycles uh, or where things are beginning to flood? So there's also not, you know, not the technical support necessary. So we definitely need more resources for all those things. I apologize. It looks like my clock has expired. I wasn't um, keeping track of that as well as I should have as the chair. So I'm going to move on to um, our ranking member. Um, Ms. Weiss, do you have questions for the panel? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Dr. Becerra, you said during your time uh, with the Oklahoma Climatological Survey that you saw firsthand how the collection and dissemination of weather and climate information has a tangible impact on the citizens spanning all communities. Being from Oklahoma myself, I want to dive into this a bit more. Um, 
besides the obvious alerting people of an incoming tornado, um, which is important in Oklahoma, how do people, um, agencies and services use this climate information? Well, certainly, while tornadoes are an important part of our, our local um, weather and climate extremes, actually, it's, you know, drought and too much precipitation actually probably have more of an impactful role in the broad scheme of things when we when we consider the, the impact of weather and climate on our state. And I think, in my perspective, working both within the Oklahoma Climatological Survey and, 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 and also working in the capacity of an academic, and working with end users and especially agricultural producers, the bottom line is, especially in our rural communities, this is a climate services are actually a very important component of that. And there's a link actually between what happens at the federal level down to the state level. And we work, you know, I'm not at a land grant university, but we have ag extension agents that actually work on the ground with agricultural producers. And there's an inherent link between all of those that are that's vital in terms of providing information that makes decision making possible at that level. The bottom line is these individuals want to know weather and climate information to make real decisions that affect their livelihood and affect the commerce of the region. And so having that is important. And the linkages in, in that chain are important. And I just heard just yesterday of um, the need for education in terms of getting more educated people um, that understand the multidisciplinary aspects of weather, climate, agriculture into a position where they can help end users make those informed decisions. Well, and you characterize um, a community using weather and climate information better than, I'm sorry, would you characterize one community using weather uh, and climate information be better than others? Obviously, um, a farmer is more likely to know about the mesonet capabilities and input than others, but are there other people that are using this information um, regionally that uh, you've identified? Oh, sure. I, I, I've seen the broad spectrum. And uh, for example, um, we've had, <laughs> we had a state representative one time who wanted weather and climate information to make sure that uh, the local contractor that was pouring his foundation uh, did so when the temperatures weren't at too cold of a level, right? I mean, it, it gets down into the nitty gritty of all the details uh, in terms of being able to make real decisions about weather and climate. And so certainly the, the rural communities benefit um, but our urban communities benefit as well. And, and we need to have better decision making that goes on there in terms of urban planning and the dissemination and redistribution of water during excessive pre precipitation events. All of that comes into play. And that's where the linkages from local to federal are really important in, in providing a consistent theme. And I, I, I want to appreciate uh, or send my appreciation to the other panel members have mentioned this. A consistent theme is important in, in establishing trust and trustworthy information that moves from one end of that spectrum to the other, and it can move both ways. And so we have to keep that dialogue move, uh, open, available, and, and that's where the people are involved, and that's what's really important. And I'll just open this question up for any of uh, the, the panelists here. Uh, you know, it seems that technology seem, and innovation seems to be something that um, would be helpful in these scenarios. Certainly, 30 or 40 years ago, it was very difficult to identify a tornado coming through Oklahoma. Now, you know, you have plenty of warning or you at least have some heads up that there's going to be issues. Talk a little bit about technology and how that can improve um, forecasting and help uh, communities as we see some of these extreme weather conditions. Well, just real quickly, I will say that the next generation of agricultural producers are more tech savvy than others. Almost all of them have one of these, right? Have a phone and they and they're using real time weather and climate information literally from the the machinery that they are using in the field to make decisions sometimes. And, and I think that that there is a critical role in providing information that can be distributed across platforms that can be put literally into the hands of end users wherever they're at. So investment is important. Yes, absolutely. I'll jump in here as well. Uh, thanks for the question, Representative Vice. I would say that we have increasingly uh, utilized the tools and developed the tools to look at immediate climate disasters, both acute and chronic, but we do not have the technology to visualize the other impacts that those acute and chronic disasters cause to economic opportunity, job access, transportation systems, uh, healthcare access, 
healthcare facilities, schools, on and on and on. And so for, for me, the investment really needs to be to develop and bridge uh, those disaster acute or chronic systems into the other sectors that haven't begun to plan for a future of climate impacts. Thank you. Thank Madam you. Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, I'll recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Prasira, I liked your priority suggestion that we need to increase our efforts in engaging and considering the needs of end users. Because if an end user, like a ag producers we've been discussing, doesn't find the provided data beneficial, it won't be used and ultimately becomes a waste of time and money. We can't just assume that someone in the lab knows exactly what someone in the field wants. You mentioned that it was through research programs like USDA's Great Plains Grazing Project that you've been able to directly engage thousands of ag producers and end users in recent years. While you might not have been directly affected with affiliated with one, could you talk about your experience there and compare it with how extension programs succeed in connecting with end users? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the Great Plains Grazing Project actually had extension from both Oklahoma and Kansas involved. So I work with both teams. Um, and, and that's how I ended up being connected with these end users in the first place. It was through their extension programs, which directly brought me into places, for example, and I learned this a long time ago, don't ever wear a tie. If you're going to be uh, talking about weather and climate at a pole barn just outside Woodward, Oklahoma, right? Um, it, and that is, helps establish trust and community, but that's also where the these extension agencies that do exist, and that and that ties in the university systems as well as the statewide systems. And that's where we get into this web of infrastructure that already exists that is viable and, and, and does have capacity, needs some strength and federal support, but it does have capacity already built within it to engage with those individuals and, and to really establish a dialogue and a back and forth that is vital and important in, in solving these big challenges that we deal with. Dr. Brasera, the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities recently reported that 69% of the buildings at land-grant universities are more than 25 years old and need urgent upgrades to remain safe and useful. Uh, as I'm sure you know, agriculture, food, and related industries contribute $1.1 trillion to the American economy and supports about 32, 22 million jobs, I should say. And these contributions are made possible by the cutting edge innovation taking place through research, education, and extension programs at colleges and the schools of agriculture, uh, like your employer, the, the University of Oklahoma, and my alma mater, Oklahoma State University. So Dr. Becerra, I want to hear from you with all the facilities you've interacted with and worked at, have you seen this deferred maintenance backlog? Can you talk about what new and upgraded infrastructure and facilities means for attracting and training the next generation of uh, scientific community? Yeah, so your, your point is very relevant. So I've worked at both federal agencies, um, you know, the, the, great, the, the Grazing Labs Research Laboratories in El Reno, Oklahoma, or the High Plains Research Lab. That's a USDA facility and, and just outside of Amarillo and Bushland, uh, but also at the university settings. And, and, and let's, let's be honest, many of those buildings that are there that are being utilized right now and the infrastructure is, is dated. Um, and I can speak to also here at the University of Oklahoma, I'm in two departments. Um, we have had discussions in civil engineering, environmental sciences that our lab space all needs to be renovated in order to really attract good students in order to do the work that we need. Now, at the same time, I work in a fabulous, fantastic facility that's new, that is, um, that, that is a resource for many, and that's the National Weather Center here at, on campus of the University of Oklahoma. And I can tell you without question that we can recruit students to that become the next generation of scientists that are solving problems, we can recruit students to this facility just because of the facility. They want to see the facility. They want the resources that are available. And so the infrastructure does matter in terms of producing uh, the, the science, whether it's in a federal lab or at a university setting. And I think that you know in, investments into infrastructure and into facilities does have a tangible role in generating the next generation of scientists that are going to be able to handle and tackle these big problems that we are facing. And if I seem like a big proponent of the land grants, you have to appreciate the fact that I find it to be one of the great accomplishments in this country that when President Lincoln 
signed the Morrell Act in 1862. It was the first time you didn't have to be a person of wealth to attend a university in the world. And we followed that with the 1890s for African-Americans. We followed that with the 1894s for Native Americans, investing in our legacy pieces that have delivered such accomplishments is just something we need to focus on. With that, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the hearing and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Lucas. Um, so now I'm gonna defer to committee counsel for the order of recognition. Ms. Bonamici is next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Cheryl, uh, the committee ranking member Lucas. Thank you. Welcome to ranking member Bice. Um, Oklahoma has been well represented on this subcommittee when I first joined. It also included uh, then representative, later NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine. Uh, thank you, especially to all of the witnesses for uh, your expertise. Climate science is an abstract. It informs the decisions our constituents across the country make every day. After the previous administration, attempted to minimize the findings of the fourth national climate assessment, including by releasing it over a holiday weekend, I decided to amplify its importance by sharing one finding on Twitter every day for six weeks. Uh, and what was interesting was the response. I heard from local elected leaders, tribes, city planners, geologists, engineers. Uh, they all appreciated, number one, the regional focus, which included an entire chapter specific to the Pacific Northwest, and they also said they desperately needed more climate data in a format that could be easily understood and that is accessible to local decision makers on the ground. Last year, I joined my colleagues on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. We have uh, Mr. Paston as well serving on the Select Committee. We released our Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, and it includes provisions to strengthen the NCA and other climate reports, but it also includes a climate risk information service to develop localized climate risk information, which will include projections of floods, wildfires, and other natural disasters. This approach will better inform the development of resilience codes, specifications, standards for our local communities. Now I'm working to turn this recommendation into a standalone bill, and I look forward to working with all of you and soliciting your feedback. And I want to start with Dr. Moss. In your testimony, you noted that no single data set or method is best available across all regions of the country. So how can Congress better support the synthesis of existing federal research and assessments on climate risks and also identify gaps to address the needs of our localities? And is USGCRP the best entity to do this work and lead a federal climate service? Great, thank, thank you for the question. It's a very, you know, it's a really central question, uh, Congressman. And the, you know, the uh, point that you've made is I don't think, you know, that it is a single agency issue. I don't think you can do it with existing authorities, even in the interagency process. I think you will have to act to establish some kind of a new authority that has sufficient resources and clout to work better across the agencies. Um, you know, I think it can work. Um, you know, the, the issue with, I would say the issue with the U.S. Global Change Research Program is the R, the research. It's, of course, the foundation for what we need, but many of you may have, you know, come up to, uh, you know, be familiar with the phrase research to operations, right? Okay. It's a continuum. Research is about creating knowledge. Operations is about taking knowledge that we're pretty confident in and using it. Um, US GPRP agencies feel that they're research agencies. Um, and so I think that we really need much more on the operations side in order to do this kind of locally relevant synthesis and application. Well, thank you, Dr. Moss. And, and that leads me to my next question. You note the need for improved technical assistance. You also highlighted the need for data and information to be findable and accessible. So how can we structure these opportunities to be more accessible, especially to frontline yeah, X, thank you. Uh, again, I think that the, um, you know, the underserved communities are going to need funding and capacity even to participate in developing proposals, for example, for funding. I note that several states are beginning to offer funding for resilience building, and there's going to be federal funding for resilience building. Even to put together the proposal um, requires uh, access to funding and to capacity that these groups don't have. Um, we have a, a proposal in, uh, we're waiting to hear back from it, to look at a number of specific communities across three, three states 
um, to identify what are the capacities that they lack, um, and then to try to bring that knowledge forward um, to inform federal programs like FEMA and others that provide the sort of help to uh, uh, communities to provide the right kind of support and resources. Thank you. And my remaining half a minute, uh, Ms. Gibbons, is there anything you can add to that about making the the uh, the information data more accessible, particularly yeah. to frontline communities? And I think that your point about NCA3 having really had a communication platform and NCA4 not having one is really critical. And I talk about that in my full testimony. So I think that when we create these products, it's not just enough to have a well-researched report and then put it on the shelf and hope somebody comes and finds it to read. We need to have developed reports that are based on the priorities that exist in communities and then bringing climate information into those priorities in a way that becomes meaningful for them and engages the communities from the research to the release to the implementation of action that follows. Absolutely. I, I see a lot of nodding heads and my time has expired and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Mr. Feenstra is next. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Cheryl and Ranking Member Bice. Uh, thank you to each of the witnesses for their testimony and sharing their extensive research and opinions with us. While researchers and scientists have worked hard to gather and make climate data available to the public, there's a need to ensure the data is easy, easily to gather and interpreted for those who need it. While I disagree that the new Federal Climate Office is the most efficient and resourceful, resourceful solution, I do agree that the federal system can be improved. Um, Dr. Basara, when dealing with the climate and weather, accurate information is critical. Last year, my home state suffered a very serious derecho, which you mentioned in your testimony. Uh, that took the lives of Iowans and wiped out millions of acres of cropland and infrastructure. Without the timely weather alerts, even more lives could have been lost and more damage done. It's just as important that we have accuracy in weather detection for smaller storms as they can cause serious damage and time preparation is at a premium. The Department of Defense shared a report with Congress in 2019, which went into detail on how obstructions like buildings can cause gaps in weather radar, potentially hiding the emergence of tornadoes or making it look like flooding where it is not necessarily there. Are you familiar with this phenomenon and can you explain its impact to the committee? I am familiar with the phenomenon. We actually have a challenge with that here in, in Oklahoma as well with one of our own um, operational weather radars uh, in parts of Northwest Oklahoma. And any obstruction, any building that is put in the way of, of basically one of these radars um, basically acts as a what we call beam blockage. You can't see accurately what's on the other side of that structure. So that is a very important issue. It's a very important role in terms of when we cite our infrastructure in terms of weather and climate infra, in, you know, resources that they need to be placed and they need to be maintained in, to, in a place where they can provide reliable information. And certainly in the case of, of weather radar, this is a critical issue um, and is, is, is one issue that we need to address because in, in order to protect lives and property, and, 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 and that is what our National Weather Service does and the many people that uh, work within that agency, in order to do that effectively, they have to have tools that are effective. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. So how can we mitigate, you know, you can't mitigate the, the buildings that are already up. I, I understand that. We have a lot of other things that are, you know, going up in a fast, you know, fast pace. Uh, and, and windmills are a great thing and stuff like this. But how can we move forward? Uh, is there a way that we can look at things before they get put up and saying, hey, this is a, this going to be a problem? I mean, we, we, we can't, you know, maybe a building or a windmill, whatever it might be, should be built in this location, this area, because it might impede uh, what we're doing. Progress is a challenge um, in, in some ways. And, and in my past life with the Oklahoma Climatological Survey and the Oklahoma Mesonet, I helped install stations. That's what we did. And you know, property, property changes from time to time and adjacent property changes. You may have a great spot, but the next owner changes, you know, you know, that land is sold and somebody else has a different vision for that product. Um, I Preservation in, in terms of uh, available space around our resources is, is something that we should be considering. Um, and, and certainly we can look at, at the um, 
at any particular site and and identify what the challenges might be and, and sort of a, a, a sphere of influence of, of what needs to be, you know, kept homogeneous or um, keep progress away just a, a little bit in order to maintain the accuracy and the viability of the infrastructure that's in place. So yes, we can do that. Um, at the same time, um, we have a lot of private land uh, and that private land exchange, uh, you know, exchanges hands from time to time. And that, that poses a logistical challenge, but I, there are resources that we can do. And we, certainly there's actions that we can take, um, but there's also the, you know, the private portion of this and, and that can't be neglected either. Yeah, I got about 30 seconds left quickly. Do you uh, do you see any technology moving forward that will better um, initiate you know, to, to see things that, at a higher level, to, to see things that are potentially happening uh, that we can uh, core, you know, communicate very quicker at a, at a faster level? Um, you know, as, as storms move across the Midwest, we see it coming, but we really can't identify some of the, the big issues. I'll speak real quickly to the fact that, you know, I'm not the expert on this, but my colleagues uh, at the university are, um, and the, the concept of phased array radar um, and being able to put that in place uh, nationally would, uh, would be a paradigm shift in our ability to observe from, from a radar perspective the, uh, any, any critical or insignificant weather that may be happening at any given location. So I think that would be at the top of my list, especially from a radar standpoint. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Mr. Kilby is next. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Chairman Cheryl, for holding this hearing and for the witnesses for bringing their really important and unique perspectives. I want to go in a, a slightly uh, different direction for a moment and talk about maybe some of the support that communities can get in taking meaningful action to deal with uh, issues around climate. Um, before I was in Congress, I was in local government for a really long time. Uh, for a good period of time, I was the county treasurer. Um, and in that particular role, um, I focused a lot of my energy and time on how to help with sustainable development in my region by breathing life into distressed, vacant, and abandoned properties in the urban core uh, on the belief that while there's all sorts of reason to do that in terms of equity and development, um, I, I have to admit that having had some frustration that a focus on reusing urban land is often looked at policy of urbanism when the truth of the matter is there's development pressure that will cause us to continue to grow the footprint of the built environment which contributes to uh, climate change in a sense, and it's a marginal impact, uh, but it has an impact because the bigger the footprint of our built environment, the more we generate in terms of greenhouse gases, and it's not a sustainable long-term approach, and it leaves a lot of communities behind. And so we have this sort of once in a generation opportunity ahead of us through this infrastructure package uh, to try to find ways to breathe life into the existing built environment where we've already made substantial investments in infrastructure and other aspects of civil society. Um, and so I'd like to, to get some thinking uh, from the panel and maybe uh, most specifically uh, Ms. Gibbons, who I know has, first of all, a connection to my home state, obviously, um, but also as a person focused on urban planning might have some thoughts on how research and knowledge that could be developed at the federal level could be shared, for example, with communities that operate land banks that are in the business of trying to uh, contain development pressure from eating up more of our built environment, taking up green fields and farmland and, and reuse existing land. Is there, do uh, you have thoughts on that subject? And is there um, a way do you think the federal government through its research capacity could support some of that? I have a bill a uh, bipartisan bill to establish a national land bank network to do uh, this in part. But I wonder if you have thoughts on the knowledge that might be developed and shared to support some of this effort. I think that a national land bank is something that could be an incredible asset to the work that we're doing in community resilience across the country. I certainly think that the Genesee um, Land Bank Authority that has served Flint and served 
your district so well is a model for the way partnerships can emerge between land banks and municipalities. I actually worked in 2012 on integrating adaptation and resilience strategies into the Imagine Flint plan, and we looked at what were the priorities of the city and ways in which we might think about the vacant spaces in Flint and then prepare to maintain some of them, to reuse some of them, to consolidate residential spaces. And we did that through a really terrific engagement program that was being run in the city. All of that went off the table when the water crisis broke and we had to refocus our attention on the equity and justice crisis that was ahead of us. And this is an example of where we can't take one piece of work and separate it from the others. We have to be prepared for communities to address whatever the crisis is that comes up. I've recently been back in Flint re-earthing that plan and talking about adaptation strategies again. I the, point this out because here is a place where we've been thinking about that question, but it's not happening in all communities. It goes back to this problem, this patchwork quilt of services that communities are receiving. In Michigan, Michigan State University in their extension program is doing tremendous adaptation and outreach work. They're doing it coupled with ag extension. They've been working with MABA, the Michigan Agribusiness Association, as well as um, urban justice organizations, tribal groups. Um, but we see an inconsistent delivery of service. And so I think that there is a role for the federal government to be playing to assess what is taking place and do a really thorough assessment. Where is adaptation and resilience happening? Where are there gaps and who is going to fill those gaps? Is it going to be a private service provider? Or is it some place that we need to step in with federally supported resources, either through our universities or through our federal agencies or a new service? I know I would like to have Mr. Moss respond, but I think I'm out of time. Uh, I appreciate that. And this is an important area. I appreciate the chair uh, holding this hearing. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a subject we need to spend more time on. So thank you, I yield back. Mr. Jimenez is next. Uh, thank you, thanks so much. I wanna uh, thank uh, uh, our chairwoman, um, uh, Representative Cheryl, and then uh, our Ranking Member Bice uh, for holding this this um, this uh, uh, hearing, and um, I'm interested. From uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Basara, you talked about um, uh, you talked about the importance of uh, accurate uh, information, uh, short term, long term, um, and modeling. Um, I'm I'm a real I'm real interested in, in modeling. Uh, I know somebody said that the, the models that we have are 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 have wide. Um, differences and that we really can't point to one model. Is there a model that, that uh, has been the most accurate than that, that we know of in predicting uh, short-term and then longer-term patterns here on, on Earth, especially in the United States? Well, I, first of all, I, I, I'll, I'll defer to Richard uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the global climate models uh, in, in that perspective. Um, on my end, uh, we're, we're constantly working on trying to, you know, from a, from a modeling standpoint, trying to simulate the atmospheres as, as, as accurately as possible, especially in short terms or weather, weather time scales. Is there one model that works best in all cases and all scenarios to forecast snow, to forecast heavy rain, to forecast tornadoes, to forecast any of these processes? And the answer to that, it really is, is no. Um, it's not the U.S. versus the European either. Uh, there, there is there. We, but we are advancing in the case uh, uh, in in the sense that we are getting more consolidation in terms of our understanding of the physical processes. And sometimes that's what's really important. It's missing was missing in our own understanding. We can't predict something we don't understand sometimes. And I think that there are some. There are some advancements on the future, especially as we get from the weather into what we call the subseasonal to seasonal, into what we call, you know, obviously the climate. And in real truth, we have a pretty decent ability to predict in the weather time scale. Um, and and certainly our, our climate models have have well the ranges. There's there's a lot of consensus, but in one of the areas I think of predictability that we are limited, and this gets into the trust issue. Um, is in that two to six month window in the subseasonal to seasonal. We don't do very well. Um, now, actually, 
efforts from this committee as well um, have, have really spurred on resource development and research into the sub-seasonal to seasonal. And that's, I want to commend the committee for that uh, because that, that's, that's a really important part of this whole process that we need to invest in to have better predictability from weather through the sub-seasonal to seasonal and into the climate scale. Yeah, well, you know, it looks to me that uh, that weather, the predicting the weather um, is uh, there's two sides of it. Number one is the short term is what what's the weather going to be tomorrow? How is it going to affect my crops? Uh, you know, do I have to, uh, you know, put up my shutters, et cetera? I live in a, in a hurricane prone area. Um, and you and even though we may have a higher than expected hurricane season, hurricanes are wherever it hits and who knows where it's going to hit. And you can you can't possibly predict that six months ahead of time. And so that that's very, very, very difficult. Long term uh, uh, trends, though, are also very important for uh, for us in order to invest in what kind of infrastructure that we're going to be investing in. How resilient does it have to be? What do we expect the long term prospects, you know, in, in an area? And so uh, is there a consensus that we're heading back into an uh, Emian uh, period um, that we had, say, 130,000 years ago, where the temperatures were two to four degrees higher Celsius than they are today. Is that the consensus of the scientific community? Is that a question for me directly or for I the guess somebody? I mean, I just I just want to know you're all this is, you know, somebody. Is that the consensus that we're heading there? And if we're heading that way, then there has to to be some kind of information as to what happened during that time, and especially in the United States, uh, what you know, what what was the long-term uh, impact of, of such a rise in, in temperatures? Uh, what were beneficial and what were not beneficial? Because, from my understanding, the forest actually grew grew more into the northern hemisphere area. That today our tundra are, were covered once by forest, and then and then we headed into a glacial period which we are, are coming out of, I guess. Uh, we're in a, in a uh, inner, inner period right now. And so those are, that's information that we can use for the long term so that we can have our investments more matched to what we think are the long term trends um, as, a, as a nation. And if there are areas that are going to be changing, you know, how can we mitigate that and adapt to that uh, as, a, you know, as a nation? Okay, I guess nobody can answer that either. All right, thank you so much. I, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Mr. Kasten is next. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our chair and ranking member for organizing this committee and many thanks to our witnesses. Um, Dr. Moss, I'd like to start with you. Uh, since 2013, the GAO has suggested that we should commit the federal government we should limit the federal government's exposure by better managing climate risk. Two years ago, they reported that we haven't made much progress. I serve on the Financial Services Committee and have been um, trying to draw as much attention as I can to the Commodity Future Trading Commission's report on managing climate risk that was released last year, where they noted in part, emerging evidence suggests that lenders are passing along riskier mortgages to the GSEs, that is Fannie and Freddie, in part to remove risk from their own books, the federal guarantee of the GSEs suggest that U.S. taxpayers may ultimately be on the hook for prepayment and default risks associated with the impacts of physical risk on collateral values. They make similar observations about the National Flood Insurance Program as a place where the private sector has an incentive and a vehicle to offload um, their risk onto the federal government. Um, I, I should note that a lot of that risk is going to affect places like Mr. Jimenez's district, um, the prior speaker. Um, Dr. Moss, um, can you identify some of the other climate risks that the federal government is exposed to? Um, and to the extent you can, um, what should we be most focused on right now? Which are the biggest of those? Well, uh, well, sir, I think you've done a really comprehensive job of listing of, you know, some of the, the really major risks that I certainly worry about um, when it comes to the federal government. I think that there can be, you know, huge impacts on financial services, on our financial uh, structure, um, huge impacts on infrastructure. Um, you know, when you, one thinks about transportation infrastructure and the federal responsibilities there, uh, the fact that so many airports are, in fact, quite near sea level along the coasts, that there's, there's real risk. Risks, huge amounts of our military infrastructure along the coasts um, that are going to be exposed to um, climate risks and flooding, um, and the list goes on. So I think that the federal government really needs a organized and comprehensive approach 
to encourage each agency to be assessing the vulnerabilities of its own assets and those of its stakeholders that they're responsible for working with. Uh, and then bringing that information forward in a coordinated and consistent way in order for you and the Congress and the, and the federal government and the, and the executive office to be able to work together uh, to start to get your hands around some of those risks. Because if we don't, they really are going to come back and be a huge drag on our national competitiveness uh, and economic growth. Well, I'd, I'd, I want to shift to Ms. Gibbons, but um, just make an observation, and maybe we can follow up afterwards, that what is so hard is that, you know, the reason I highlighted those programs is that they exist where the federal government is trying to subsidize the neasiest who couldn't otherwise afford housing or insurance. And as we think about how to mitigate that risk, there are some really hard equity questions. Um, and, I, and I say that in my pivot to Ms. Gibbons, because, you know, given your, your organization and your focus, um, I I can't help but thinking about this report in any news about two weeks ago, where they said that just eight counties in Alabama, Louisiana, and Florida accounted for half, half of the $1.2 billion in NFIP claims uh, last year. And while the effects of climate change are obviously global, there are, there are very localized specific areas that we know are gonna bear the brunt of this. And when we talk about that in other countries, we acknowledge that it's a refugee crisis, right? When we talk about that in our country, we talk about it in the terms of adaptation because it is so hard for us to contemplate the alternative. And given your focus on adaptation, how would you suggest, leave us to deal with the politics, but how would you suggest that we think about that tension between adaptation and relocation? Yeah, I'll just speak briefly. I'm sure Liz has other thoughts on this too, as she's sitting in the seat of, in Louisiana. You know, we think about managed retreat as being part of a suite of adaptation strategies and communities need to have the opportunity to have the information they need about their risk, but also to explore what options are going to be possible. And then the federal government is responsible for enabling those options so that they can make those decisions with dignity. But if I may, I would love to have Liz respond to this. Yeah, thanks so much, Beth. Um, I would like to say that absolutely there are certain places where it is predominantly lower income folks who are developing in higher, I mean, who own property in higher risk areas. However, that is not true across the country for, sh for sure. And there are other places where we continue to subsidize ongoing development and um, the flood insurance program at, at a rate that's not actual and uh, it, at a scale that is insurmountable. Um, I would, as I mentioned in my testimony, and there's more detail in my written testimony, we see ongoing climate induced migration already. It's not a future scenario in Louisiana, it's already happening. And it's the people above a certain income threshold who are able to make that decision. And, and they would, we, we call that adaptation here. It is a choice to relocate elsewhere. Typically it is moving one town up or to the next area perceived as safer, which may or may not be. Um, um, and so this is a point where we need more sophisticated risk analysis and communication and technical assistance capacity in those local areas to actually work with people who are making the decisions. We also need stronger regulation to prevent increased development that then we end up subsidizing as a federal taxpayer um, and through the federal systems, both NFIP um, and through mortgages that are backed by the federal government. Uh, we have to begin to address those systems and we also need to connect that challenge with the technical assistance and the types of mitigation activities to address the risks at the local level. Um, I'll also say in the areas that are growing, uh, because again, we have places that are already growing as well as losing population, we don't have uh, the practices in place to consider strategically where new development should actually be occurring and where that ends up falling back on uh, where those parishes are trying to grow their population, grow their tax bases, they're not regulating any of the new development that's occurring. And it's really critical that our federal systems are stood up um, and actually deepened in order to acknowledge those variances, acknowledge where there are, is lo a local disincentive to talk about the risk that's in those places and where we're ending up pushing back that vulnerability onto the American taxpayer. Well, thank you, and thank you to the chair for allowing us a little time to get into a very comprehensive response. I appreciate it. Yield back. Mr. Christ is next. Uh, your microphone is, is not on, Mr. Chris.
Is that better? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, also, and thank you to the Assistant Secretary for joining us today. The Economic Development Administration, or EDA, has been instrumental in supporting American communities throughout the pandemic. I applaud your agency's dedication to fulfilling the mission during this time of great need. Through the American Rescue Plan, Congress provided $3 billion to the EDA and included a 25% set aside for communities that have suffered significant economic loss in the areas of tourism, hospitality, and outdoor recreation industries. Uh, this set aside is used for my home state of Florida, which as you know, is heavily dependent on all of these industries and has uh, suffered significant economic loss due to the pandemic. I think I've been given the wrong material. Please hold. <laughs> hold on one second. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Secretary, and for your indulgence, Madam Chair. My home state of Florida is very susceptible to outbreaks of harmful algae blooms. These outbreaks will continue to increase in severity and frequency as climate change warms our water. So the monitoring of forecasting services that NOAA provides are critical in helping us and local communities determine their risk and post warnings in a timely manner. Uh, Ms. Russell, can you discuss how the federal government currently provides harmful algae bloom prediction and response resource to coastal communities? Yeah, so I, I would love to get that information to you. I'd be happy to follow up uh, and have it formally inserted to the record, uh, but with full transparency, algal blooms are not my area of expertise. Anybody else on the panel willing to address that or prepared to address that? Okay, well then I think I'm done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, thank you. And algal blooms are certainly something I'm deeply concerned about as well. So happy to discuss a uh, further hearing on that topic. Um, but before we bring the hearing to a close, I want to thank our witnesses for testifying before the committee today. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. The witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.